Um, so hi everyone, I'm uh, Amandine, I'm a postdoctoral researcher at University of Glasgow, and I'm also a visiting uh, researcher at Cornell University in uh, the US. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, pathogen transmission between uh, introduced species and native species on oceanic islands. And before starting, I want to acknowledge that uh, you see we, I will mention lots of uh, samples and data that have been collected, so that's part of uh, a large collaborating effort with people uh, based in France where I did my PhD, uh, both in the, on the academic side of things and on the conservation side of things, and also with uh, veterinary laboratories that are uh, helping us with uh, sample analysis. So when we uh, look at infectious disease in wildlife, we tend to focus on the one species we're studying. For instance, uh, if some of you have been studying gannets for a long time and you've seen avian flu in your gannet colony this year, you might have been mostly interested in what is the impact of avian flu on the gannets. Uh, but as you know, uh, different species interact together. And so for instance, you might have wondered maybe the skuas are uh, interacting with the gannets and contributing in uh, spreading the virus between different colonies or introducing the, the virus in the first place. Uh, so we have different species in an ecosystem that can play different roles in our uh, epidemiological network. So we can have bridge species, which will spread pathogen between different uh, subpopulations. So for instance, different colonies in seabirds. And we can have um, reservoir species, which are involved in the maintenance of a pathogen in a system. So the fact that it sticks around uh, over a season, across different seasons, and so on. And it's important to acknowledge those different roles that different species can play, uh, even if we might be tempted to only focus on the one species for which, which we have a specific interest. So for instance, uh, very often when we look at infectious diseases, people are very concerned about uh, endangered species and might neglect the other uh, players in the, in the system. And the reason why it's uh, important to consider all those species is because uh, if you put all your efforts in trying to um, eradicate, eradicate a pathogen from a subpopulation, but you keep having reintroduction from other uh, species or other subpopulations that are around, you might end up uh, wasting lots of money and time and resources uh, with uh, something that is, uh, will fail eventually. Um, so to illustrate all that, I will take you to Amsterdam Island, which is in the uh, southern Indian Ocean, uh, right between uh, South Africa and Australia. We have big populations of yellow nose albatrosses there. So you can see uh, a colony, pretty dense colony here on a, on a cliff. Uh, and the birds have been monitored by seabird biologists there for uh, several decades. And uh, you might uh, notice uh, what people observed in the field on this picture is a dead chick under the parent. So the chick started dying suddenly and recurrently year after year. So that's the typical uh, survival curve that we get uh, a given year. So the chicks, the chicks hatch. And within a few weeks, we start losing uh, chicks and eventually reach really low breeding success, uh, close to 0%. And that's happening over and over again. So here you can see over four years, we had three years with uh, almost no chicks uh, fledging from the colonies. Uh, in parallel to the uh, mortality, we detected uh, the bacteria Pastorella multocida, which is the agent causing uh, avian cholera. Uh, so you can see here that we have a, a nice uh, mirror effect, a nice symmetry between the prevalence of the bacteria in the chicks, in the, in the seabirds during um, the breeding season and the mortality. So we have years with very intense uh, outbreaks. Uh, lots of the chicks are getting infected and lots of the chicks are dying. So we are pretty confident that those bacteria are involved in the recurrent mortality events that we are uh, observing. Uh, in addition to the data I just presented, we also have uh, histology data so we can observe uh, bacteria within the tissues of the dead birds. We could isolate the bacteria from tissues that are um, supposed to be sterile like bone marrow, heart, brain, and so on. And uh, I would say the ultimate proof is that we vaccinated the chicks against uh, Pastorella multocida uh, a year, and we uh, did have a significant increase in the survival of the chicks. So that really means that uh, uh, those bacteria are responsible for the, at least some of the dead that we are uh, observing. And I was talking about Indian yellow-nosed uh, albatrosses, but I want to highlight that it's uh, not uh, restricted to those birds. Uh, we also have other cliff-nesting seabirds that are affected by the outbreaks. 
Uh, and we uh, also have uh, lots of concern on the uh, endemic Al uh, Amsterdam albatross breeding at the uh, top of, of the island. And so here you can see regular crashes in breeding success for the three uh, cliff nesting seabirds uh, that uh, ultimately, because it started in the mid 80s, uh, are uh, impacting the population size uh, of those birds on Amsterdam Island. And there's a, a real concern here because um, all those species are endangered. For uh, yellow nosed albatross, we have two thirds of the world population on the island. So uh, if it goes instant, that would be a, an issue, a, a global issue. For the northern rock hopper penguin, uh, as you may know, it's a quite small uh, population with only five uh, islands harboring the species worldwide, so uh, also lots of concern there. Uh, but I told you we have a vaccine, so maybe we can just vaccinate all the birds and the uh, issue is solved. Um, but you might, I don't know, if you, you, know, if you work in, a, in, in seabird colonies in the field, you, you might be overwhelmed by the idea of vaccinating a significant amount of birds to be able to protect uh, them uh, for, um, from the pathogen and rescue them from extinction. Um, so we thought instead of trying to every year vaccinate uh, thousands and thousands of birds, hoping that our uh, intervention will have a, an effect there, uh, maybe we can try to understand where the pathogen is coming from. Why is it, does it keep coming back every year? Because uh, hopefully we'll see that with the flu, but pretty often what's, what's happening is that we have an, an outbreak that will last a year, maybe two, three years, but eventually will fade out. It's not the case on Amsterdam Island. The pathogen is sticking around and we don't know why. Um, so one of the main reasons why we're curious about that is that, as you know, seabirds are in, in this area, in this part of the world, are very seasonal. So every winter, they all migrate at sea. Uh, so even if we have very dense colonies in summer that are very propice to uh, pathogen transmission, in winter, there are just no birds on the island, and uh, we consider that there are very likely uh, not many contacts uh, for pathogen transmission when they're at sea. So how, how can we explain that the pathogen is coming back every year? I'll take you through a bunch of uh, uh, hypotheses that we've uh, explored over the, the last three years. So the first thing is maybe we have sustained transmission or chronic carriage in the birds. So maybe the birds are leaving the island, but they're taking the pathogen with them, and when they come back, they reintroduce the pathogen to the island. So to, to tell that, we can uh, look at several things. The first thing is, uh, if you look on this plot, you have little triangles at the beginning of each year. That's the prevalence in the adult birds. And you can see that pretty often, uh, the prevalence is actually really low in adults. So at the beginning of the year, it looks like the pathogen is, is not highly prevalent, except the one of the year where the outbreak started a little bit earlier. And if we look at the ringed individuals that we can track over time, we can see if they get infected and if they recover from the infection. So I've zoomed on the one that we've been tracking since uh, 2013. And when they're yellow, it means they are uh, negative for the pathogen. When they're red, they're positive. And you can see that lots of the birds are actually switching. Even if they get infected at some point, they will switch back to non-infected uh, in yellow. So it looks like you, we can have... Um, uh, the birds are easy, uh, easily capable of cle uh, clearing the infection. So I cannot say for sure that we don't have chronic carriage or that the birds are not maintaining the pathogen uh, in winter where they're at sea. But if it happens, it's probably very rare. So let's look at another uh, hypothesis that would be an environmental reservoir on the island. Uh, same, that's something we've talked about for flu. Sometimes if you have water pullers, we can have virus or bacteria staying there. Uh, the thing is that on Amsterdam Island, we don't have... Uh, we don't have any water at all on the um, island. And because also it's a, you know, it's a salty environment, it's not ideal for, um, for pathogen survival. Uh, when we have rain, we can collect some, some uh, water samples. We've never found the pathogen in there. So same, there's no evidence that happening. Uh, if it happens, uh, it might be quite rare because the conditions are not uh, ideal at all. And so the last hypothesis we were left with is repeated spillovers from another host. And in particular, we uh, draw attention to rodents because they are the only uh, resident species on, on the island. They are the only ones that are not migrating. Um, so we have black rats and um, house mice on the island. Sorry, brown rats and uh, house mice on the island. So if we want to have spillover from between the seabirds and the rodents, we need two things. The first thing is contact between the two uh, species. 
so you can see here we have rats um, eating on a, a dead chick. You can actually not see the, the chick under, but you have to believe me. And we also have uh, rats biting chicks uh, while they're still alive. So that could be an opportunity for both the rats to get infected by the pathogen if, uh, while they're eating dead birds, but also transmit the pathogen to live ones. And we can see a, a few birds with wounds uh, like, like you can see here. And the second thing we need is carry age, uh, like rats carrying the, the bacteria. So on this map, uh, again, we have uh, yellow is negative, red is positive. And you can see that on the southwest of the island, where we actually have the seabirds breeding, we have that hotspot of uh, infection in the rats. And where it gets interesting is that uh, it's also the case in winter when there is no more birds on the island. So we think that maybe the rats are uh, carrying the, maintaining the, the bacteria on the island uh, as being host for those bacteria, notably in winter. Um, when we look at antibodies in the rats, we see that rats all over the island have been exposed to the bacteria, and we think that could potentially happen, notably thanks to skuas moving rats around uh, and also moving the bacteria because they are themselves preying on dead uh, albatrosses and uh, getting uh, infected with Pastora mutosida. And for instance, if we look at the movement of skuas just within a day, they move all over the island. So you know if they eat a dead bird in the morning, uh, in the afternoon they are pooping at the north of the island, then they can uh, potentially spread the bacteria over. Uh, so in conclusion, that's the idea that we have now uh, for uh, epidemiological system for avian cholera on Amsterdam Island. Uh, we still need to get genetic data from the bacteria, which is quite tricky, I won't go into the detail here, to confirm uh, mixing between the different populations. And one of the things we're looking forward to explore is um, how the dynamic of uh, avian cholera will change as we remove rats from the island, as that's something that's planned for the future. Uh, so in conclusion, it's uh, important when you look at infectious disease to go beyond the target species, so not only the albatrosses, but also the other players in the system, to understand the ecology of your system, to uh, be able to better understand the epidemiology, to consider the potential of uh, impact of introduced species beyond predation, because that can help us then to uh, identify sustainable solutions against infectious diseases. And the final note I want to make is that it's not only on Amsterdam Island and it's not only avian cholera. So we are putting together a network of islands where we have rats, no rats, or rats that are going to be removed, and we're tracking um, how pathogen uh, maps uh, in those different populations across those islands. So if you do have uh, rats uh, or mice on your islands and you are interested in looking into infectious disease, feel free to reach out. Cool, very interesting. We've got one question, time for anyone? Yeah, it's, that's not obvious that it can happen. So I don't know, it's, it's hard to say, because it looks like mammals can be uh, infected by the strain of avian flu that's currently in the north. So we've had dead uh, foxes and dead seals. Uh, so maybe they could get infected, and if they don't die, then they could potentially spread it. Uh, I doubt that it's the main mode of transmission, because flu is notoriously good at spreading just by uh, aerosols. Uh, but it could potentially be a contributor. Thank you. Okay, thanks very much, Amazine, and reach out to her if you've got uh, suitable study sites. Okay, now I'm pleased to see some waterfowl on the uh, program. We're going to move to, and also considering prey and invasive species from uh, Paola, who's going to talk about long tailed ducks and uh, yeah, invasive fish. everyone. Thank you for being here, uh, listening to my presentation about uh, uh, the response of long-tailed duck to the change in the main prey availability in its Baltic wintering ground. I am a third-year PhD student in Klaipeda University, and this is the work that came out from the first two years of my PhD. 
So um, the Baltic Sea is one of the most important wintering ground for the long-tailed ducks and for many other sea ducks. Uh, but unfortunately, in the, in the Baltic Sea, there are many, many threats. And the population of long-tailed duck um, decreased uh, down to 65% from 4.3 millions of individuals in the beginning of the 90s down to 1.5 million of individuals um, in, a, in an estimate that was made in 2009. To 2009. And uh, in the recent year, it was estimated to be around 1 million, the population. Um, also, one of the main um, impacts in the Baltic is the bycatch, in particular in the Lithuanian waters, uh, is the bycatch in the gillnets, and many attempts were made to reduce the impact of bycatch, but they were unsuccessful. Um, another uh, disturbance, let's say, to complicate the life of long-tailed duck is the introduction of an invasive fish species, which is round goby, that uh, impacted and changed uh, hugely the benthic community in the Lithuanian coastal waters. Uh, round goby it's, uh, um, really likes blue mussel, and it decreased the, um, the density of blue mussel uh, from 2.3 kilograms per square meter down to 100 grams per square meter in the hard bottom area of, of the Lithuanian coastal waters. Why I'm telling you this? Because this was also the main prey for long-tailed duck. In, in the same area, and this um, led to the shift in the diet to, uh, to different organisms. For this reason, we decided to evaluate the temporal variation in the diet of long-tailed duck in different seabed types, and also we decided to assess the species response to the change of the, in the environment uh, by uh, three steps. So comparing the diet between individuals of different sex and age groups, but also assessing the diet during the last few decades using also historical data. And we wanted also to quantify the differences in the body condition over time and between different bottom types. So uh, briefly, I will explain you the study area. So um, from here, from Klaipeda upwards, we have um, hard, bottom, um, hard bottom areas with heterogeneous bottom composed with boulders, pebbles, and different sizes of, of sand, and then a southern area, um, sorry, the northern area was the, the area that was impacted by round goby. And the southern area instead is an homogeneous sandy bottom, and the, the benthic macrofauna there, it's pristine, like there, is, there were no big changes in the macrofauna in the last decades. Um, so, and in this study area, we collected the long-tailed duck from the winter 2016 till the spring 2020. We were collecting the bicot um, long-tailed duck from fishermen. We were taking them to the, to the lab for morphological measurements and for the, the section, and we were collecting the stomach content, but also evaluating the body index. Uh, and once we taken the, the stomach content to the lab, we were... Um, we were uh, collecting the, the species, uh, identifying, weighting them, and measuring the, the land. So the results were on, on the total of 267 stomachs, and only 6% six, six of them were empty. And also we, uh, the, the statistical analysis were uh, based on two different bottom types, as I said, soft bottom and hard bottom, but also based on the different sex and, the, and the juvenile and adults. So what we saw from, what you can see also from the first two figures is that long-tailed duck had a more diversified diet in, in hard bottom rather than in soft bottom, but this is of course related to the uh, different macrofauna com community and more diversified in, in hard bottom. But also you can see that they preferred, uh, sorry, they preferred a lot the macrofauna, as you can see in the uh, figure C, which is based on the abundance, but um, for instance, in, in the biomass instead, you can see that in soft bottom, they prefer much more the biomass than, than the fish. So from, from this thing, we, we can see that the diet uh, changed according to the bottom type, but also that males have a more diversified diet uh, than females. And one thing that you cannot see from here, but you have to trust me, is that juveniles were not differing in the diet from the, from the adults. 
Um, another thing that we wanted to investigate was the variation of the diet during the wintering months. So in hard bottom, fish was the main prey from December till February, and then the, the diets uh, shifted to crustacean uh, in other months, and while in soft bottom, the crustacean and bivalves remained the preferred prey during the whole period. Um, one more thing was the body index. So the body index actually gave us a good idea that long-tailed duck were in, in good body condition in both um, bottom types. So as you can see, they had um, a score of seven out of nine. And also the, yeah, the body indexes were similar between also adults and juveniles and male and female. One last insight, which is actually very interesting, is based on this historical data. This study was uh, uh, done in the, of Gidelis and Rushkita in 2005, was done in the same, exactly same study area. Um, and it was before the impact of round goby, of the invasive fish species. So what you can see immediately is that they had a more, um, they, that long-tailed duck were eating more and more diversified, as you can see, like 17 species were eaten um, in, in the year 2000 when they collected the data, and now they are eating 31 species. Uh, but also the abundance of prey in the stomach was much higher. Um, another interesting um, thing is the presence of Mytilus edulis, uh, which is blue mussel, as I said before, that it um, hugely decreased in the hard bottom areas. And in fact, you can see it from, from, the, stom from the frequency in the stomach content, which was 92% in, um, uh, in the previous study, and now it decreased down to 20%. But another and very interesting thing was the absence of this Osmerus eperlanus, which is um, a fish, um, which is um, migrating in the same period as, as long-tailed duck in the, in the area, uh, in the Lithuanian coastal waters. And in, in, 2000, in the year 2000, it was completely absent in the stomach, and now it increased on the uh, 18%. Uh, one last thing is the body index. So as you can see, the the values are very similar, so it means that they, anyway, they manage to be in a good body condition despite the change in the diet. So the key messages of the study are that long-tailed ducks demonstrated a very quick response to extreme changes in the main benthic prey, and they were able to shift their diet to new prey items in hard bottoms. But in soft bottom instead, under uh, unchanged prey composition, as I told you, in soft bottom there, there was still this pristine uh, community that did not variate, uh, long-tailed duck demonstrated a relatively stable feeding. And so despite the change in the, in the prey, the body index value, they were stable, and so they were actually sh uh, showing an effective shift to an efficient feeding to maintain bod uh, good body condition. Thanks for your attention. Thanks very much, Paula. Anyone got any questions for her? I'll kick off with one while you're all considering and thinking and coming up with good ideas. Um, yeah, so I'm intrigued. So I was just thinking of the talks earlier on water quality. Mussels are very important for that kind of thing. So do you think that has any effect on the bird's ability to find and locate different prey species? if the mussels have gone down? Well, um, we have, well, the, the condition in the, in the Baltic Sea actually is not so bad that we, um, that would impact so much, uh, but they are more important actually, and we have another species in the Kuranian Lagoon, which is like much more uh, affected by chlorophyll A, for example. So there the decrease would be much more important than in the Baltic, I would say. Um, yeah, very good talk, thank you. Um, uh, just a, a point of detail, I think you mentioned on the, on the soft bottom area, the number of prey items remain the same across the period. Yeah, almost but the same. The, the number of species, but the number, the abundance of the prey actually increased in the soft yes. bottom, isn't that right? What, what, what do you think the explanation for that is? Was it a change in prey size or? Uh, mm, can be. It could be that there was a, a change maybe in, in prey size, but um, maybe it was just, I really don't, I wouldn't know how to answer, I'm sorry. 
Okay. Well, maybe it's just an environmental uh, change by, by long-tailed ducks. They just, I, I don't know. <laughs> Thanks very much. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have any information on how the birds may have changed their time energy budgets? Are they spending more time foraging for these species or less time, or has it remained fairly similar? No, I, we don't have this information. Uh, actually, now I'm working on, the, on velvet scoters, on, the, on their time budget for the purpose of the thesis. Well, and hopefully I will tell you more next time about this species, but no, we are not studying now the long-tailed duck time budget. Perfect. Next week we're conference. Thank you. Okay, if there's not any more, we'll, we'll move on now. Thank you very much. Hi, so I'm going to be talking about the unfortunately timely topic of pathogen surveillance um, and discussing some work that I did recently at the Center for Functional and Evolutionary Ecology in Montpellier, France uh, with Dr. Thierry Boulinier. So seabirds can uh, be potentially useful as sentinels of pathogen circulation in natural systems. And so what I mean by sentinels are species or populations that can be used to detect and monitor the presence of established and emerging diseases of interest. So this schematic from uh, Halliday et al. shows kind of the relationship between a sentinel po population, the target population of interest, and then the pathogen itself. So there's this kind of triangular relationship where sentinels are interacting with pathogens and target populations are also interacting with pathogens and then independently the sentinels and targets are interacting. Um, so in the example of uh, coastal seabirds, um, you have a species that uh, or, you know, group of species that uh, has many transmission routes both to be exposed to pathogens and then to transmit them elsewhere through their long distance movements. Um, they're known to be exposed to pathogens. Uh, they're in environments where there are high concentrations of pathogens and coastal systems. Um, and they interact with target populations, whether that's humans, livestock, or other uh, seabird and other wildlife species. So there's a lot of potential there, but then there's this other piece to understanding um, how to use information from sentinel populations, which is you need to know how they respond to pathogens in order to know what kind of aspects of um, responses in sentinels you can monitor to understand underlying circulation and changes in circulation of pathogens. So in urban gulls, uh, we know that these are species that are widely exposed to pathogens through their foraging behavior. Uh, they're predators and scavengers often on human refuse. Uh, they interact with humans um, through their behaviors uh, and just through their, their spatial distribution. Um, they eat sewage, which is a great source of pathogens um, and other, other uh, fairly dirty food sources. Uh, and they provide accessible sampling targets, uh, given that they're relatively common um, and abundant in close proximity to human settlements. So the humble yellow-legged gull has a pretty impressive re resume of uh, pathogens from previous studies. Uh, so we have detections of pathogenic yeast in gulls, uh, detections of various viruses, including avian influenza and uh, flaviviruses, and a wide variety of bacteria, including toxoplasmosa, antibiotic-resistant E. coli, uh, Salmonella, Campylobacter, Chlamydia, etc. So these are, you know, fun species to work with. Uh, and so when you're talking, I don't think I need to really introduce uh, this, you know, post-COVID group to the idea of antibodies and how they differ uh, from viruses, but basically uh, you have a fairly, fairly limited window in which to detect an active virus infection through a PCR test, but antibodies persist in the system long after the virus has, itself has less, left the system. Um, so this gives you an indication of an individual's prior infection history um, and doesn't require you to happen to come across that individual at that limited time when it's actually shedding viral DNA. So it's easier to detect than active infection, but it's a bit complicated. So when you're looking at um, adult immunity in a long-lived bird or human, uh, this is a function of both the severity of the infection and the time since the infection occurred. Um, and so the actual timing and location at which that individual is infected can be fairly difficult to infer. Um, so it's interesting in terms of sort of population level um, exposure dynamics and infection histories, but doesn't give you a lot of sort of localized time-specific information. So this is where nestlings come in. Uh, nestling immunity is a little bit more closely tied to local conditions because nestlings don't move around very much. Um, and it has 
but it does have its own complications, um, which include the fact that nestling immunity is actually uh, a anti antibody dynamics. And nestlings are a combination of maternal antibodies, uh, which are deposited in eggs, and environmental exposure. So maternal antibodies, we have some pretty good information on from previous work, including this Garnier et al. paper, uh, that showed that um, there's actually a relationship between life histories. So uh, birds with longer life histories, such as Corey Shearwaters, will have uh, a longer period during which these maternal antibodies are present in a nestling system, um, but the, they do decay. And in shorter-lived species like the common quail, they decay much more rapidly. Um, so there's this variation in the persistence of maternal antibodies um, within the system of a nestling. And so we can kind of derive this theoretical relationship where maternal antibodies decrease with time while the probability of exposure to a pathogen in the environment and the probability of acquiring immunity uh, increases with time. So that was uh, basically what I was interested in looking at in this study. Um, so we wanted to compare um, different life stages to looking at adults, eggs, and nestlings in terms of um, their, their, the presence of antibodies to common pathogens in their systems. Um, we wanted to look at trends in nestling antibody levels during nestling development to look at this comparative influence of both maternal and environmental sources and to kind of evaluate um, what kind of recommendations we could make for using nestlings as a sentinel uh, population for pathogen monitoring in the system. So we uh, worked with yellow-legged gulls on Friul Island, which is off the coast of Marseille in France. Um, so this is in the Medi Mediterranean Sea and um, basically within spitting distance of France's second largest urban area. So very uh, heavily urbanized population. Um, there's, within the, the larger system, there's 20 to 30,000 nesting pairs of yellow-legged gulls, and they're a target of management, um, which is done by egg oiling. And we looked at three pathogens. Uh, so we looked at avian influenza, and don't get too excited, this isn't highly pathogenic, it's no specific strain of avian influenza, so I can't speak directly to, to the highly pathogenic uh, strain. We also looked at Toxoplasmosa gondii, which I'll uh, abbreviate as tox, and infectious bronchitis virus, uh, which we're interested in because it's a gamma coronavirus, so it's in the coronavirus family, but not one of the um, genera of coronaviruses that is transmissible to humans, uh, but is transmissible to livestock, such as chickens. So it has important economic implications. Um, and the main mechanism that we used to look at temporal dynamics of antibodies and nestlings was an egg swapping experiment. Um, so we, we basically did this to separate out maternal from uh, exposure effects. Uh, we selected pairs of two or three egg nests. We floated eggs to determine nest egg, egg age and then separated uh, swapped eggs of comparable age between nests. Um, if there's a third egg present, we collected that to analyze antibody levels and to get kind of a starting value uh, for that nest. And then once eggs uh, hatched, we checked the, the nest daily to be able to associate the hatchlings with the eggs. So once a bird hatched, we were able to know whether it was the, the original egg or the swapped egg. Um, just to go through sampling methods briefly, and I'll do this in a little bit more detail than usual since I imagine some people are interested in uh, kind of sampling uh, protocols for surveillance. So we sampled adults. Uh, this was part of a tracking study. We captured adults at nests using box traps and drew uh, one milliliter of blood from the brachial vein at the time of capture. Uh, we sampled eggs. Uh, this was generally early in the development of the egg so that you still had an intact yolk that you could separate out um, and use that for the antibody analysis. Um, and then for chicks, uh, as I mentioned, we ring ch chicks shortly after hatch so we could follow them through their development. Um, we collected half a milliliter of blood every three to five days through fledging. Um, and I'll briefly mention, if you're ever in the field with a baby, uh, front carry is the best for collecting blood and uh, the dorsal is best for putting on transmitters. So you can take that with you. Um, and then for the older chicks, once they started to, to move around a lot more as they get closer to fledgling age, we used these triple O1 loggers, which we took out of their kind of housing and put on the backs of chicks. And these are um, loggers that communicate by Bluetooth with a, with a cell phone. So if anyone's interested in that, uh, kind of locating older chicks as they move around, um, and that's a, a relatively cheap way to do it compared to using like a, a VHF transmitter and, and worked fairly well. So uh, in terms of analysis, uh, we used ELISAs, uh, and um, these, are, these don't take very much blood. So once we were, were finished doing all the ELISAs that we wanted to do, we still have a, a good chunk of blood left over. Uh, so you don't need a whole lot of blood to get quite a bit of information. Um, and once you've stored the blood, you can keep coming back to that and doing uh, further sampling if you come up with sort of new pathogens that you're interested in looking at retroactively. 
Um, so these are, and these are pretty simple to do. I'm not a super, you know, laboratory oriented person, but um, I figured it out. So if I can do it, I think most people probably can. Uh, and uh, we had, you know, the good luck that Amandine had already uh, validated this for egg yolks, so we can compare uh, blood samples directly to the egg yolks. Um, and then in terms of looking at the temporal patterns in antibodies and nestlings, uh, we used a breakpoint estimation. Um, basically what we did was we assumed that there was a first phase that was the exponential decay that I showed you of, of maternal antibodies, uh, where the total antibody concentration was um, basically a function of days since hatch, uh, which is the D term, um, an error term E, and then a coefficient A, which was the rate of exponential decay, um, alpha, sorry. And then we have a second phase, which we tested either an exponential growth or a linear growth of um, exposure probabilities. So the linear growth, you just have this beta coefficient, uh, basic linear kind of uh, exposure. And then if you have an exponential growth in exposure, so exposure is probabilities increasing with age, um, you have an exponential relationship, including uh, days since hatch and, and an error term. So, uh, to go through some results uh, for the infectious bronchitis virus, just to get that one out of the way, we basically had no circulation of that. So no detectable antibodies in either adults or chicks. Um, didn't bother testing eggs, because that'll be a function of, of the adults, so we didn't really expect to see it in the eggs either. So basically there's no, no infectious bronchitis virus circulating in this system. Um, for avian influenza and toxoplasmosa, or toxoplasma gondii, we had the highest levels of antibodies in adults, followed by eggs and chicks, and a, and a stronger circulation of avian influenza um, across all life stages. So the relationship was the same, but the magnitude was a lot higher in avian influenza compared to toxoplasmosa. And then looking at uh, changes over time, as chicks uh, went from zero to days through, through 40 some odd days, um, so we have higher starting antibody densities in chicks for avian influenza compared to toxoplasmosa. Um, we have breakpoints happening in, in both of these relationships, but at a later stage in avian influenza, given that the, the starting values were higher. So we had uh, day 24 was when we changed from exponential decay to, to linear growth, um, and day 15 for toxoplasmosa. In both cases, the linear growth uh, fit better than the exponential growth for uh, post-breakpoint. Uh, for the exponential decay, so the decay of maternal antibodies, we had a similar rate of decay, even though the starting values were different uh, between the two uh, pathogens. And then a higher rate of external environmental exposure following the breakpoint uh, for avian influenza compared to toxoplasmosis. So suggesting that there's a higher probability of exposure um, in general for nestlings to avian influenza. So finally, looking at um, the comparisons between biological and foster siblings in our egg swapping experiment, uh, we had pretty similar results. So basically, the, we're, I'm showing the differences between uh, foster siblings in pink and biological siblings in blue um, over time. So we start out with biological siblings being more similar, and they get less similar as time goes by, um, while the foster siblings get more similar. So we found that they, um, basically, the differences between foster siblings decrease through day 21 for avian influenza and day 14 for toxoplasmosa, similar to the, the previous results, um, and that we found similar differences after that point between biological and foster siblings. So what this suggests is that there's pretty, pretty similar rates of exposure between different nests. There's not a lot of variation where individuals at the same nest are more similar to one another. So, in conclusion, um, we found different uh, concentrations of antibodies uh, among pathogens and higher uh, antibody levels in adults, followed by eggs and chicks. Um, we found maternal antibodies being prevalent in early life um, with higher rates uh, for pathogens at which um, higher levels of antibodies had been transferred in eggs. Um, antibodies in chicks approaching fledging age are more reflective of external exposure rates once the maternal antibodies have kind of disappeared from the system. We don't find too much heterogeneity in exposure among nests, so random sampling of near-fledgling doll chicks could be a pretty useful tool for uh, pathogen surveillance and monitoring in the system. So uh, in the future, we're going to be linking um, pathogen exposure and transfer to spatial ecology. So we have these great tracks from adults that show um, lots of foraging inland at dump sites and other uh, fun places. And also these migrations of about a third of the tracked population up to uh, urban centers and agricultural areas in sort of northern uh, parts of and northern and western parts of France. So that's a, a pretty solid indication that this population is interacting uh, with, with important um, important areas pretty far outside the Mediterranean. 
Um, we're interested in exploring effects of management and egg oiling on adult movements and therefore pathogen spread. Um, we're interested in retroactively testing for, our, for highly pathogenic avian influenza in the samples we already have, and also in investigating uh, juvenile dispersal in the future. So uh, thanks to collaborators, and I'm not sure if I have any time left. I think I ran out the clock. Um, but thank you very much for listening. Thanks, Juliet. We'll go one burning question, if there is one. Well, you can cut. Oh. Just curious to know what you do with the samples of these pathogens when you finish them. Do you flush them down the toilet or do you have some more sophisticated? Well, so since this is antibodies, they're not actually uh, infectious, <laughs> infectious samples. Uh, so, yeah, we have these blood samples in storage, and um, this is a case where, you know, we can collaborate since, you know, a, good, a blood sample goes a long way, so we're collaborating with some different groups looking at things like contaminants um, that can use these blood samples, and we can kind of store them for future use as different pathogens emerge to go back and look at whether we detected them in the system earlier. So that's the, the good thing about blood samples, is you can kind of hang on to them and, and do different things with them in the future. Cool, thanks, Julia. Okay, now we're going to move from uh, disease to disturbance. It's going to stay a bit urban, and Kat Booth Jones is going to give us some information about IDAs. How's it going? Um, so my name is Tara. I work for Birdwatch Ireland um, as part of the Dublin Bay Birds Project team, um, which is funded by Dublin Port Company. I'm here today just to talk to you a little bit about the terns which are nesting in Dublin Port and the monitoring work that we've been carrying out there between 1995 um, up until the present day. Um, so the Dublin Port Turn Colony, like the name suggests, the, these turns are nesting within a port. Just to give you a sense of how busy and how dynamic this port is, nearly 50% of all trade in the Republic of Ireland is handled by Dublin Port. Last year, um, in 2021, they estimate that over 7,000 ships actually arrived into Dublin Port. So this is a really, really busy, really dynamic industrial environment with a lot of potential for disturbance. And so having a lot of cooperation between the various stakeholders in the port, um, in the environmental sector, is really important. The uh, tern colony in Dublin Port mainly comprises of common terns with smaller numbers of arctic terns also breeding in the port. They breed on man-made structures within the Dublin Port area. Around 10% of the Republic of Ireland's common tern population actually breeds in, in Dublin Port. So it's pretty important in a national context for common terns. Both common and arctic terns have been nesting in Dublin Port since at least 1949, but monitoring began in 1995. And this was led by the late Oscar Mern of National Parks and Wildlife Services with some help from Birdwatch Ireland staff and volunteers, and continued on until 2012. Then in 2013, um, the Birdwatch Ireland's Dublin Bay Birds Project was set up, funded by Dublin Port Company, um, and it basically was set up, part of its remit, um, part of the remit of the Dublin Bay Birds Project is to monitor this turn colony and also to help inform management decisions of the colony. Um, and there are key stakeholders um, within Dublin Port, um, or within the colony, and these include Dublin Port Company, the Electricity Supply Board, or ESB, um, and ourselves uh, at Birdwatch Ireland, National Parks and Wildlife Services, and the Liffey and Port Marine Services. So again, just to emphasize, the collaboration between all of these stakeholders is really, really important to the continued conservation of this colony. Okay, so pair numbers have increased quite significantly over the 27 years of monitoring, rising from 71 pairs in 1995 to a peak of 645 pairs in 2019. Um, just two quick caveats about the data. In 2016 and 2017, the number of pairs that are recorded here are underestimated, and this was just due to access issues to one of the platforms. So um, Dublin Port, um, the, sorry, there's four breeding structures within Dublin Port. Um, these are the Special Protection Area Platform, which is managed by ESB, the CDL Dolphin, or the Coal Distribution Limited Dolphin, which is owned by Dublin Port Company. Um, both of these structures are permanent structures, i.e. they're fixed in place. 
Then we have the Talca pontine, which is up outside of the shipping channel. We have the Great South Wall pontine, which along with CDL, Dolphin and the SPA platform is within that main shipping channel. Okay, so the SPA platforms and the CDL Dolphin, like I said before, they're both fixed structures. Terns have been nesting on these platforms since around 1984. Um, and these platforms have been modified specifically to accommodate breeding terns. So modifications include the wooden perimeters, um, which have been wooden perimeters which have been put around the perimeter of the platforms. Um, and this is to stop things like eggs and chicks from rolling over the sides and into the water, but also just to give the colony a little bit of shelter. In addition, shingle has been added as nesting substrate. Chick shelters have been added. On the SPA platform, these are wooden. On the CDL dolphin, these are uh, plastic pipes. And on the SBA platform, compartments have been added. Uh, the, so the platform has been subdivided into compartments. Um, so the SPA platform, it rose from 49 pairs in 1995 to a peak of 538 pairs in 2012. Um, it's so important uh, for breeding common terns that, in fact, it was included within the South Dublin and Talca Estuary um, Special Protection Area. However, it's quite an old structure, and over the years it began to deteriorate, and in 2016 it partially collapsed. So ESB, which managed the platform, um, they significantly renovated and improved the structure of breeding terms, and they, they did a really good job, to be honest. Um, and we'll go into some of the modifications that they made later on. Um, coming down to the CDL Dolphin, which is just the two photographs at the very bottom. Um, so this is the main breeding platform for Arctic terns within the colony. Um, we reckon that there's between 10 and 20 pairs of Arctic terns currently breeding in Dublin Port. Okay, so the Talca and the Great South Wall pontines, these are the latest additions to the Dublin Port Turn Colony. Um, both of these pontines were deployed by Dublin Port Company specifically to accommodate breeding terns within the port. The Talca pontine was deployed in 2013, and the Great South Wall pontine was deployed in 2015. And again, both of these structures have been modified specifically to accommodate breeding terns. So this is just an overview of pair numbers um, over the, on, on each platform over the no, last number of years. Uh, again, just a quick caveat, the scale bars aren't exactly the same, so they're not directly comparable, but we'll walk through them. So up in the top left corner um, is the SPA platform. Um, again, you can see that numbers were rising, rising, rising up until 2012. Um, However, in the last number of years, we have had a slight decline in the numbers of terns nesting on um, the SPA platform. And there's probably a couple of reasons for this, but two potential reasons are, firstly, that during that renovation work back in 2016 and 2017, the Great South Wall pontoon was brought up beside the SPA platform um, to accommodate any terns which might have been displaced. So the GSW pontoon might have just taken some of the terns away from the SPA platform. Secondly, the SPA platform, unfortunately, um, is now underneath where a pair of peregrines are holding territory. So um, it's getting a little bit hammered at the minute, so that's probably another reason why those numbers are going down. Uh, CDL Dolphin, like I was saying before, it is the platform where, common, or where Arctic terns uh, mainly breed within the port. You can see in 2018 and 2019 that there's this big bump in numbers. Um, that's common terns. So the, the kind of, over the last number of years, common terns have started to outnumber, in most years, Arctic terns on this platform. So it's just a change. It used to be mostly Arctic terns with a couple of common terns. Now it's mostly um, common terns with a couple of Arctic terns. Coming down to the bottom left, that's the Talco Pontine. Uh, Talco Pontine has been a bit of a mixed bag. It's been hit quite hard by rat predation over the years. Um, however, this year we had a big bump in numbers. Um, two possible reasons for this. Um, last year in 2021, some modifications were made to the platform to stop rats from hopping onto the platform and having a snack. Um, and um, also we accidentally added some additional nesting space to the uh, pontoon last year um, when it started to sink, we added another pontoon on and the turns were taken to it. So the, both of those factors could um, explain the, the bump in numbers this year. Great South Wall Pontoon is um, kind of the star of the show in terms of pair numbers the last while. It's, it's doing quite well pair numbers wise and in fact supports the highest number of turns within the Dublin Port area. So moving quickly to productivity, a bit of a mixed bag across the different platforms. Um, 
low productivity in some years and across some platforms is usually driven by predation. So if you see the purple bar just there, that's the talco pontoon. It's the one that kept getting hit with rat um, predation. You can see it's quite low in many years. And in 2021, after those modifications were made, we are seeing a bump in productivity. It could just be a correlative, um, it could just be a correlation, but um, hopefully those modifications have made a difference and we'll see higher levels of productivity as we go along on that pontoon. Okay, so coming back to predation. So we've had a variety of predators um, in the Dublin port area over the years, um, including rats, otters, and avian predation. So we have our peregrine pair, um, and we've had gold predation as well. So those turnings that you can see, they were found um, by, uh, by a volunteer down on Docky Island a few miles south of the colony, um, and they'd been predated, it looked like, by a great black bat gull. Um, so with the rats, some of the modifications that have been made when ESB, when they renovated the SPA platform, um, they installed a metal hatch door which stops any rats from hopping up into the colony. Um, they also created this amazing cantilevered um, platform. You can see it on the top, it's the second photo from the left on the top. It's an amazing cantilevered platform with this wooden perimeter, again, just makes it really difficult for uh, mammalian predators to get in. Um, pontoons, there's a, a, overhangs are put onto the perimeters of the pontoons um, and these are either metal or wooden and again it just stops rats from being able to climb onto the pontoons and baffles are also put onto the mooring chains. So in the Great South Wall pontoon for instance they're using traffic cones as, uh, as baffles and they seem to be working quite well. Um, otter. So we had no idea that otters could climb ladders, apparently they can. Um, and it was climbing a ladder, so it's the second photo on the bottom, it's climbing up that ladder and into the colony and eating whatever it wanted to eat. So um, a wooden board has simply been placed on the top third of each of the ladders on that platform and it was placed there this year um, and as far as we're aware we haven't had any otter predation so far. Um, avian predation, uh, currently the SBA is getting hammered by peregrines so those are the, the towers, the third photo at the top, those are the, those are the pigeon house towers, that's where the peregrine uh, pair live just below them is where the turns are. So it's, it's really, really difficult to mitigate against that. And just a shout out to Jimmy Murray and co of the Liffey and Port Marine Services who like, were instrumental in, in making a lot of these modifications to the um, platforms. Ringing, okay, so the purpose of ringing in Dublin Port is twofold. Metal ringing we use for productivity. Colour ringing began in 2015. And the reason, one of the reasons that we began colouring was to examine the question of how are the terns responding to all of this additional um, nesting space that they have been provided with, i.e. the pontoons. Is the colony growing or is it just redistributing? Now, we have gotten really cool recitals from like the wintering grounds or on migration from other colonies. We have struggled to, to address this question within the colony, the Dublin Port colony itself. And there's a few reasons for this. Um, we can't actually, because of those perimeter boards, we can't actually see into the uh, platforms or because of the height of the, the platforms, we can't actually see into them to read the rings. We have limited visits to the colonies and there's a lack of hides generally um, on those platforms. In 2019, however, Dublin Port Company did install a hide on the CDL Dolphin. And this is an amazing addition to the CDL Dolphin. But unfortunately, the CDL has been hit with really high levels of predation over the years, which has made either the turns really skittish when we are out there, or just very, there's just been very low numbers of turns on that platform. So hides on the old platforms would be really beneficial for starting to address these questions. We have used alternative uh, methods for ring reading. So since 2021, uh, we've been nest trapping adults. On the platforms, um, we've nest trapped 24 adults so far, and 10 of these had previously been ringed. Um, we've also been using cameras over the last number of years. Um, we were using them for predation to measure predation. However, the acorn trail camera, little uh, acorn trail cameras, are actually quite good for picking up rings, so if anybody wants to use those, they're really good. Reeling security camera, using it um, for promotion, but again, if the birds are close enough, we can read rings using that. And we've recited 11 birds to date using those two cameras. Okay, so in summary, <laughs> um, really, really important to protect your um, existing nest size. But one thing that we have found in the port is that the terns seem to respond quite well to the provision of safe, suitable, and alternative habitat, but this habitat has to be maintained um, and it needs to be modified. Monitoring is key, um, as we all know. 
Um, it's key not only within one colony for identifying threats and informing those management decisions, but it's crucial at, all, um, at a range of sites so we can understand how the overall population is faring. Basically, the Dublin Port Turn Colony is all about collaboration. It's a story about collaboration. And collaboration and good relationships are key to the conservation of the Dublin Port Turns. And we are very, very lucky that everybody who's a stakeholder within the, um, this, this project has been incredibly cooperative um, and collaborated really well. And thank you very much to all of the people listed and to you for listening. So. One question for Tara, if there is one. I wondered if this is, um, is this intended to be like a, like a post child for other locations within Ireland, or is this just a kind of special thing for Dublin? Um, well, I know, well, here in Cork, there is, there's obviously the, the term um, colony there. So I suppose it's more about learning from, from what each other is doing. So what, what's being done here in Cork, we try and use to inform what we do in Dublin, and we'd hope that what we're doing in Dublin, whether it's, it's the right thing or the wrong thing, is then used to inform how colonies are um, managed elsewhere. Does that make sense? Yeah. Cool. Okay, we'll move on. And the last talk of the session. <laughs> and we're going to stay urban, and we're going to consider whether, well, a different species, but whether these birds are actually happy where they are, or whether it's all just kind of like the classic duck on the water and the feet going fast underneath. And this is from Anna Norte. Hi. So my name is Claudine Nort. I'm, I come from the University of Coimbra, from Arnet, Mare Arnet. And I'm going to present a work of a large team with diverse backgrounds on breeding girls, especially urban breeding girls. As so everybody knows, there's a growing pressure of urbanization over natural habitats uh, due to population growth. And um, so while species uh, either adapt or have to, f to move to other areas. Urban areas may offer some advantages to all animals, including abundant and predictable food resources. Uh, depending on the mode of transmission, they may be less prone to acquire disease um, and they are exposed to lower temperature variation. The disadvantages include negative interactions with humans and, of course, higher exposure to contamination uh, and also noise and light pollution and higher competition for food, among others. So we use the yellow-legged girl, large Michaelis, as a model species. It is a flexible, opportunistic species, and we wanted to evaluate if there is a behavioral tolerance that may facilitate its adaptation to urban environments and the advantages and disadvantages of breeding in urban areas compared with natural areas. So, uh, for the first part, we did an experiment to evaluate the behavioral stress response of the yellow-legged gull to a direct anthropogenic stimulus, disturbance stimulus, and we compared that response with that of a similar species, uh, Ictiaeus alduini, that also breeds in sympatry in the south of Portugal in Deserta Islands, because it's a similar species, uh, but uh, it doesn't interact so much with humans or human-derived resources. So we sampled 24 nests of each species, twice during the second week of incubation. For this, we used uh, dummy eggs, similar to those already used by Ellenberg with penguins, um, that we placed in the nest and record the, with a microphone. They record um, the heart rate, the heartbeats of the incubating birds. And we placed the eggs during daytime for seven hours and uh, uh, the original egg was placed in, incubator, in an incubator in the meantime. So this is a diagram of our experimental setup. We started around nine by deploying the equipment to the dummy eggs and the thermoigrometer to assess the mean, uh, the nest temperature, micro environmental temperature of the nest. Uh, when nobody was in the colony, we uh, took samplings of basal heart rates, 
And then we did our disturbance um, uh, stimulus, which was to approach the colony and do a transect of 10 minutes in the middle of the colony. Um, and we, at that time, we took a measurement of the stress heart rate. Uh, and we also um, measured the time that the girls uh, took to resume incubation duties after disturbance. And we performed this in the morning, early uh, afternoon, and in the end, when we went to collect the material, we could collect, again, a basal heart rate and a stress heart rate when we approached to uh, retrieve the material. So the eggs provided us with a sound file that we could listen and open in Audacity that looked like this. And through a custom-made uh, software developed by the Laboratory of Instrumentation and Experimental Particle Physics in the University of Coimbra, uh, we could automatically uh, translate the sound file into heart rate. Um, and this exported a CSV file um, with the, the heart rate of the individual. And also it uh, provided us with a debug file that we could check uh, in some files manually if the software was really detecting a heartbeat of the bird, which is what you see uh, here. So we could see if it was matching correctly the heartbeats of the bird. Um, now we are, we are using an uh, even um, more um, sophisticated egg that also has an internal um, temperature sensor so that we can study the incubation temperatures. So this is um, what looks like the heart rate of an incubating gull. and eventually it flew off when we approached the colony. Um, to compare between the breeding colonies, we had uh, two urban colonies, one in Porto, the largest one, and one in Peniche, and two natural colonies, one in Berlenga and one in Deserta. Um, and we had two years of data of breeding parameters, the nearest nest, egg volume, clutch size, and hatching success. And we collected some health parameters of adults, uh, including the body condition, and also for the chicks, the early chick growth rate of the first chick to hatch during five days. For, we also collected some blood samples for physiology to measure uh, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, which is an indicator of uh, acute infection, blood hemoglobin, um, white blood cell counts and profiles, and some oxidative stress parameters. So for the results, first we checked, these, these are preliminary results. First we checked if our disturbance stimulus was effective, and we compared the heart rate, uh, the basal heart rate with stress heart rate, and we could see that there was always an increase in heart rate with our uh, stimulus, with the transect in both species, um, and those, the, there were significant differences in these basal and stress heart rates for all the periods except uh, for Odwin's girl in the first period of the day. Uh, we also, also looked at data consistency between original and replicate samplings, separated by three days first and second samplings, um, and uh, we found no difference, no evidence of a reduced heart rate response, so stress heart rate minus basal heart rate uh, between the, the first sampling and the second sampling, with the only exception of the uh, Odwin's girl in the middle of the day, in which in the second sampling well, almost there was no difference between basal and stress heart rate. 
comparison between species, uh, we standardized the heart rate response uh, for the body mass uh, from the literature, but we didn't uh, uh, detect any significant differences in their response to the stimulus. Uh, but uh, regarding resume time, we did, it did detect an effect of species, but um, large Michaelis took longer to resume incubation than uh, Alduin's goal. Uh, we also did find an effect of ambient temperature, and when there were higher temperatures, the girls took less time to resume incubation duties after disturbance. The comparison between colonies. This is, this is just now in uh, IBIS Journal. Um, we found that uh, the, the nearest nest was farther away in urban colonies. The egg volume was significantly lower in Porto, the largest urban colony, and the probability of a three egg clutch was significantly lower in Peniche. Peniche adults also had lower body condition. Um, there was a tendency for lower hemoglobin in urban colonies, and the adults from Deserta, the natural colony in the south of Portugal, had higher erythrocyte sedimentation rates which may indicate acute infections in these birds. Uh, we found no effects of in white blood cell counts, uh, but the adults of Deserta also had higher heterophile to lymphocyte ratios, which is a generalist indicator of stress in birds. Um, and uh, we did not find any effects in oxidative stress in adults. Uh, for the chicks, there were lower growth rates in Porto than in Deserta. Here we only have the largest urban colony and the, lar and the largest, no, not the largest, and the reference colony, natural reference colony in south of Portugal, um, in Algarve. Uh, so in, in Porto, they, they grew uh, slow, more slowly. They uh, had lower erythrocyte sedimentation rate, a tendency for lower heterophile to lymphocyte ratio in Porto, lower white blood cell counts in Porto, and no differences in hemoglobin, uh, nor in the oxidative stress parameters. So to discuss, we did not uh, find a uh, lower susceptibility of uh, large Michaelis to human disturbance, because there were no differences between species in the heart rate response to our stimulus. Um, and uh, Larus Michaelis even took longer to resume incubation after disturbance. There is no evidence of habituation to our um, stimulus, uh, although the Alduin's goal um, didn't show a response in the replicate sampling, but and maybe with the repetition of these uh, transects, we could get, we could uh, see an, an habituation. We don't know we should um, study this further. Which will, what would also be very important would be to compare the same species in different environments, in urban versus natural environments, uh, and to check their uh, behavioral responses to direct disturbance in those environments. The yellow-legged girls from Porto led smaller eggs and smaller clutches, and she growth was slower in Porto than in Deserta. So yellow leg girls in Porto may be younger and inexperienced, but also and non-exclusively uh, at the diet they, are, they feed on may be of lower nutritional value. However, physiological metrics show that adults and chicks from Porto may be, may be less exposed to disease and infection. Um, maybe due to lower density in Porto, and adults and, uh, from Porto showed uh, lower levels of stress, uh, probably because in high density colonies such as Deserta, more frequent antagonistic interactions might lead to social stress and higher HL. So girls may be facing complex trade-offs when breeding in urban environments, and detrimental effects may be only noticeable in the long term. So, and because there is high intraannual variation in rearing conditions 
and also because of the local environment characteristics of each colony that could superimpose on the dichotomy urban natural. Uh, we should do long-term studies with replicate, more replicate colonies in each natural and urban habitat and combining bro both breeding and physiological health, health metrics to fully understand the life history strategies of urban girls. And thank you uh, to everyone that helps collecting data and funding agencies and to you for listening. Thanks. Thanks, Anna. Apologies for butchering your surname. Um, anyone got a question for Anna? There's a lot of process in that talk. I wondered if, um, so the heart rate didn't change, but I wondered, did you also measure like the flight initiation distance? Did they kind of hang around for longer at all? Or did they always? No, we, we didn't. Uh, I was thinking about that also with the previous presentation. It would be interesting to study that, yes. Um, but at the time we did not do it. Maybe in the next experiment we'll add that. Yes, it was very interesting. All desperate for more sustenance. Um, okay, so I'll thank Andrew again and all the speakers in this session.